Okay, so this is the end. And uh, what can I say? So that's the first semester of calculus, excluding trigonometry. But I think for the most part, you guys had um, a little bit of an easier version of this class. I mean, a lot, maybe too many homework problems, I'll give you that, but some of the problems were a little bit easier than other calculus classes. We never had to prove anything. We never had to do epsilon delta, and we never had to do anything with trig. Other than that, I think we had a lot of applications leaning towards business, so I think the class was good for that. And even if you don't go into business or finance or anything like that, since we always think of money, um, you know, living in the society, it's a good application of these things, right? Because this is all applicable to at least money. So that's that's understandable. Now, we had some applications with um, physics and that kind of thing. All right. Uh, so some um, some housekeeping things I want to mention. So this announcement is going out either in the morning or later today. And this is the final exam rules and everything you want to know. Um, the reason why it's going out later is because this video that I'm recording right now will be posted inside this announcement. So that's why it's not posted already. The required password is just password all lowercase. Um, so when they ask for your password, put it in. You don't have to schedule a particular time to take the exam. Whenever you open it, that's when the that's when the clock starts. So it's you know it's like a level of Mario. Once you get in that level, it's going to start counting down. It's going to count down uh, 120 minutes. You got two hours to do it, and you only have 20 questions. Now, of course, those 20 questions have parts. So there's that too, especially with the increasing, decreasing, maximum, minimum. There's a lot of that. All right. There's a lot of those questions on the exam. There's a lot of um, parts. The good thing is that, believe it or not, the good thing is, even if you miss one part, that doesn't mean you miss the question. So in some ways it's good, in some ways it's bad because it's time to continue. Um, the material is just chapters three and four. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the book and show you what I'm talking about because I think more of homework for this style of class than textbook because I don't really just read the textbook. We don't go over the textbook that much. Uh, so I think more of homework, but really it's just after the midterm. It's just what we've been learning after the midterm that you're going to be um, asked on. Okay. I have a formula sheet posted. Um, <clears throat> you can use that during the exam, and it has uh, various formulas. Some are helpful. Some I would imagine you already know. Um, you know, I wouldn't rely on this to the point of, I, I mean, to me, it's more of a ref, it's literally a reference sheet, not something you're not going to learn from the, the cheat sheet or whatever. Uh, but I think this would be at least helpful if you want to peek at this um, before the exam and then after the exam, there's some helpful things on there. So you are welcome to use that. And that is posted in the modules, but it's also posted in this announcement. So you don't have to go digging for it. Um, the material you are expected to complete is there is a homework for this week. It's about half of what we normally have. Uh, there's not two assignments, there's one assignment. Um, so it's about half what we usually have to tackle. Okay. But it's it's just to review what we've done. So it's things you've already done, but you need to do it. All right. Uh, so it is graded. You have a quiz, you have a practice test. And then you have an extra credit assignment, okay? So you can choose to do it or not do it if you want. I really hope you do it because I, I did a lot out of doing it. Um, a few of you have already completed it. It's an advice quiz. So I'll give you extra credit for doing. I want you to give advice uh, to students that are incoming to this class. So um, students that are coming from the 23 to 24 school year, uh, what, what would you say what advice would you give them? Okay. And, you know, I can say a lot of things to students and they'll believe me or not believe me, but students learn from students, really. If another student says something 
they'll take it to heart. If a teacher said something seven times, they might catch it on the eighth time, right? And it, it's just true. I mean, it's a scientifically, there's even a name for it, a study. Anyway, uh, so advice quiz. I hope you'll do it. I'll give you extra credit for doing it. I think you can get up to like a 2% overall grade bump just by doing it. Because I get a lot out of it. I'm going to compile the responses. I'm going to take everybody's name off. And if anything's like obvious of who it was, I'll take that off. But um, I'm just going to compile a list for my calculus class and my finite class. And then I'm going to give that to the incoming class. And I'm going to show them. This is what people said that took your class that just finished, right? They'll have that. And I can already see the number one suggestion is you have to schedule your time. That's for my finite class. I had almost half the classes already completed it. And they all said you have to pace yourself and schedule yourself. You cannot wait for the lesson. So I don't know if that's what you found, but that's the biggest hurdle, it seems to be, is. You have a week to do all this material, which means you have to schedule that week to do it. And that, that seems to be uh, the consensus. I didn't even see that many things mentioned specifically about content. It was mostly just about scheduling. I'll post the lecture video that I'm in right now, screenshots from whatever homework problems I do today, my notes, and then bonus content is only if you're interested and you know, mathy kind of things, or maybe you're going to computer science, a video that um, goes in a lot of what we've been talking about that I thought was super interesting. Um, it isn't from this person, it's a math video, uh, but this video is of, um, it's about one of the algorithms in uh, an old video game that uh, was able to um, use some of the calculus tricks that we did and coming up with a quicker way of doing inverse square. So that's something just bonus. If you're in computer science, if you're interested, if you're now taking calculus, I think you would find that interesting. Or maybe you like playing video games, you might find it interesting. So I thought I would just mention it. And that's totally bonus. There's nothing, no assignment to do that. All right, let's go to, um, before I get into the final, let me go into advice quiz. I have to cut that out of the video. All right, you have successfully completed a calculus course and achieved exceptional results. Now that you've been tasked with sharing your knowledge and experience to help future students excel in studies and well-prepared exams, write an essay outlining the topic, advice, and study habits you believe would greatly benefit them in the finite course. Support your recommendations with specific examples and strategies drawn from your personal experience, insights gained throughout the course. So I just want to know, what would you tell someone coming in? So they're going to start in late August, August 21st, I think. So when it starts, what would you say to them? How, how can they succeed? How could they succeed going through this course? Most likely, they will be taking the course that's exactly like this. Okay, this seems to be the going format with Ivy Tech, so what would you tell them to do? How can they succeed? All right, uh, from there, I have a few things to mention specifically about the final exam. Okay, so the final exam, uh, let's see. So the final exam, the password again is password lowercase, okay? All lowercase. All right. Time limit, two hours. So when you open it, it's going to start counting down. So be sure that uh, you're ready to go, and it's only one attempt. So once you open it, that's whatever happens is what happens. Okay. Um, I will uh, 
Um, I will be going over your responses. Um, I will try to flip through everybody and give as much partial credit as I possibly can. Try to do that with the midterm. Um, so, you know, I understand that the computer can misunderstand things or maybe you put a negative sign, it should have been positive, vice versa. Maybe you put in the wrong variable, it should have been T when you put in X. I do that sometimes too. So that kind of thing, I'll make sure that the computer is not just giving you a zero. So when is this thing due? It's due on the 30th. It's due at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. So even if you're in Hawaii, it's still due at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, when that server ticks, that's the time, it's closed. Everything is due by that moment. That is the last moment of the semester. There are no extensions beyond that, okay? Whatever you get done, that's what you got done. So I can give you partial credit. I can do that kind of thing, but I can't extend assignments past that. I can't give you an extension on anything, okay? Um, that being said, don't email me and ask me, okay? Um, yeah, just, if you didn't, you know, if you're not coming to class, don't email me that uh, you need extensions, okay? I don't, I don't care. Uh, my email is full of students and my class is not. So take that with what you can. Okay. So that's, that's the deal. Password, password, time limit attempts. It's due and it's really due. Okay. It's really due. Not kind of due, but really due. All right. Now from there, there's a few things I wanted to talk about with the textbook, which I don't normally talk about the textbook. Maybe sometimes I pull out a few formulas. But the test is only over chapters three and four, okay? What is that? So chapter three was uh, using the first derivative to find the maximum and minimum. We take the first derivative, we set it equal to zero, and that's where the derivative is horizontal, which means that's a maximum or minimum, if it exists. Uh, using the second derivative uh, to find the inflection points. Asymptotes, there's a lot of asymptote questions. Optimization, of course, and then uh, elasticity. I would, I'm gonna, when I go over the problem, I'll go over a few comments about elasticity. You definitely want that formula in your mind. Um, logarithmic, Differentiation, it was difficult when we went over it in the class. I remember that was a hard one. Um, it's not like, you know, it's not covered more than anything else on the exam. So I wouldn't overstudy for, um, you know, log. I wouldn't dedicate too much time to logarithmic differentiation over anything else, even though it was quite a bit more difficult. I would, however, on implicit differentiation. Okay, I noticed but the problems that, that the exam is selecting, it's selecting a lot more implicit differentiation than on the other topics. So I would dedicate a little extra time to that. Okay, you'll see that in the homework. The homework is gonna guide you to what you should be studying. Um, so we'll see that when we go over it, but even though logarithmic differentiation, difficult, you wanna, you know, it was a lot, I wouldn't overly study, but I might overly study on implicit. So just throwing that out there, of kind of guiding what to, what to look over again. Now, chapter four, uh, that is covered only up to 4.5. We're not going to go over 4.6 and 4.7. Don't go over them. Don't worry about them. Again, if you do the homework for this week, that guides you through what you need to know, but we don't need to uh, learn integration by parts. That would be the second semester. And then numerical integration, we don't need uh, as far as what 4.7 goes over. So 4.1 to 4.5 is what we need to study, but it'll make sense when we get to within the 
Okay, any questions, questions about final exam and concerns? Online, any questions, comments, or concerns about the final exam? Before we get into the gory details, okay. Just stop me if you do. All right, uh, so let's go over the homework. We do have homework for this week, but it is a review, and the review, I think, will guide you to what you need to know. Okay, uh, so number one, the, the great thing for you guys is that I think in the future, you might actually have to graph some of this stuff, but we're still doing where you just pick the graph. So lucky you, not so lucky uh, for the future, because I think they're going to come out with an updated version where you have to graph it yourself. All right, f of x has a positive derivative over negative infinity to negative 2, which means it's increasing, and negative 2 to 8, and it has a negative derivative, which means it's decreasing from a to infinity, and the derivative is equal to zero at x equals two, okay? So why would I pick this? Well, it must meet all of the criteria. Here we have, uh, it's increasing. We have zero, then it's increasing, zero, and it's going down. So that's just picking the graph. That's not uh, as bad as having to graph something like this. To do, to really do that, you would have to do the fundamental theorem of algebra. But we don't have to. We just have to pick the draw. So that's quite fun. Number one, it's just kind of a warm up. All right, number three, or sorry, number two, I have a few comments on of what to do and what to think about. Um, so find any relative extrema of the function, list the extrema along with the x value at which it occurs, identify intervals in which the function is increasing over which it, over which it is decreasing, then sketch and graph of the function. So you guys can use graphing calculators. So of course you can just plug that into your graphing calculator and take a peek at it. So that's not too bad. Um, if we wanna find extrema, I think it would be good to find the derivative, right? So to do that, I'm going to take dg dx. So this is just the power, so it'll be 3x squared minus 4x minus 15. Okay. If I set that equal to zero, x squared minus 4x minus 15 equals 0. Okay, let's see what, what we can solve from there. Now, we can either factor this, use the quadratic formula, um, however we want to figure this out. Uh, let's see, how can we solve what x values this would be? So here we have an a that is greater than 1. We have a c. So we could do a c method. And that's what I chose to do. So to do that, I mean, this is just algebra, you know, high school algebra techniques that we're using. So AC method, we find negative 45. We have to find the factors of negative 45, which add to negative 4. I found 9 and 5. If I make 9, negative and five positive, those add to negative four. So from there, I can go three x squared minus nine x minus five x minus 15 equals zero. I can group them. So I get three x, x minus three minus five, x minus 3 equals 0. I can factor out x minus 3. 3x minus 5 equals 0. So that means x equals 3 and x equals 5 thirds. Positive 5 thirds, negative. 
Well, for one thing, I mess around with this. Gives me three X minus five. There we go. Okay. So the function is increasing or decreasing by this point. Okay. So we have our X and Y, in which the uh, tangent is zero. So the tangent, well, I guess we can't talk about trend, which the derivative, the first derivative is equal to zero. So G prime of X equals zero. Is telling us where that is occurring. Here we have the two x's. So I found that uh, there is some kind of change there. We can graph this. You could use your graphing calculator to plug this in. And I found that from negative infinity to negative five thirds, it is increasing, but it's also increasing from three to infinity. It's decreasing from negative five thirds to positive three. So that's the idea. Just taking the first derivative, setting equals zero, solving for x, and then I was able to just simply take the graph. Not too bad. If we had to find the maximum and minimum, we would plug those values back into the function. And since this is open, we wouldn't have, we don't have to have an absolute maximum or absolute minimum. We might just have a relative, but we can plug those values back in there and find those. Uh, relative maximum. Okay. That's the idea. Questions on that? This is fairly similar. Let's start from the beginning. So it wants to know the relative, but we can do that. So it says, find, for the following function, give the coordinates of any critical points and classify each point as a relative max or relative min or neither. Identify intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. Give the coordinates of any points of inflection. Identify the intervals in which the function is concave up or concave down and sketch the graph. Okay, so I might, I might actually plug this in my graphing calculator to see what's going on. But I think one thing we can do with relative ease is find the first derivative and then set that equal to zero. And that will at least tell us um, some points of interest. So 30x squared minus 24x plus 45. So if I set that equal to zero, that'll tell me where these two x's, if there is two, that will tell me where um, where the relative max or min are occurring. Okay. Um, so we could use the quadratic formula, or we could use um, AC method, or complete the square. But I'll say. I found that x equals 3 and 5 when using those techniques. So now we can plug that back into the function g of 3 and g of 5. We can find the relative max or min from here. Okay, this won't be the absolute because with the absolute maximum, we'd have to have a closed interval, but here we do not. Okay, so yeah over all of the real numbers. When I plug those in, I got 59 and I got 55. So I just plugged those values in where the first derivative equals zero, plugged it into the original function, outputs relative max or min. So we could see that the relative max would be 59. The relative min would be 55 and where those occur, so that's not too bad. Again, we could just plug that in a graphing calculator and graph it just by pi. Where is it increasing or decreasing? That can really help by looking at the graph and seeing where that occurs. See that? I'm gonna use decimals, but of course you can use, um, can use a graphing calculator. Or I'm gonna use decimals to demonstrate. So 
So we had D x equals x minus 12 x squared plus 45 x. There is our relative max, relative min, right there on my graph. And you can see where it's increasing. It's increasing from negative infinity up to x equals 3, but not including x equals 3. And then also starting at x equals 5 to infinity. This is where it's increasing. Where is it decreasing? From 3 to 5. Let's see where that occurs. Beautiful. Where it's increasing and decreasing. Where are the coordinates and flexion points? That's where the second derivative equals zero. So you can easily take the second derivative of this function. That would give you uh, 6x minus 44 equals zero. So x equals four. where that occurs, you can plug that back into the original function, goes into g4, get 57 once we do that. So we find that that is the inflection point. Where is that inflection point? Take a look, I can show you visually. Here, we can see where it's turning from concave down to concave up. I don't know if my computer will let me do that. Not quite. Understands I'm tapping it, but it's oh, oh, here we go. So x equals four, about here is where it's cutting off. Okay. So about there is where it's going from concave down to concave up. The inflection point is when the second derivative equals zero. So g double prime of x equals zero is how to find those inflection points. What intervals is a concave up, concave down? We just talked about that. So concave up, remember, up is a cup, down is a friend. Concave up. Think of a smiley face. Concave down. Down is a friend. And that's when the second derivative is greater than zero, when it's positive, negative. Okay. So the good thing is it kind of ties in with our English language of negative, down, frown. Those are all negative. And it also works with our parabolas here. So down is a frown, concave up, up is a cut. This I can determine those. And then we just picked a graph, but I used a graph of calculator. So that was very good. Any questions about that? Questions, comments, concerns? Uh, number four. Number four, it just wanted me to determine the horizontal asymptote. Well, I like this question because there isn't one. Since the order of so this order has a, uh, it has a higher order than the denominator. There was no horizontal asymptote. So that wasn't too difficult. It's fairly easy. Yeah, so that's. That's easy. That was number four. Number five. This one's a little bit tricky. We have to be careful. So it's a, it's not, I'll probably graph it because it'll be easier to describe what's going on. But with this, we have a, we have a bit of an issue. So note that we can't divide by zero here, all right? We have 
5x minus 7 over x. x cannot equal 0. Because we can't divide by 0. Because if we plugged in x equals 0, at least with mine, you'd have negative 7 divided by 0. And we have no definition of what that means. We don't have any understanding of what it means to divide by zero. So we can't do that. So we have to exclude that. Okay, so we x cannot equal zero, which means we have a vertical asymptote. X equals zero is a vertical asymptote, it's cutting it down. So the function cannot touch that. That being said, let's see what happens with finding the derivative and so forth. Okay, so finding the derivative, so f prime of x is d over dx of 5x minus 7 over x. Okay, well, I guess I would use quotient rule for something like this. So I'd find the derivative of the top, which would be 5 times the bottom function minus top function times the derivative of the bottom, which would just be 1, and then over the bottom function squared, quotient. I have to do a little bit of simplifying here. Okay, 5x minus 5x plus 7 over x squared. And those cancel. It's 7 over x squared. So that's the derivative. Now, what happens? If I set that equal to 0, f prime of x equals 0, that's going to tell me where these critical points are. If I set this equal to 0, where does that equal 0? It doesn't. So it wouldn't be defined. There's no definition of that critical point. So this it, it's not too bad of a problem, but it's a little tricky. You have to kind of be careful, especially if we just can't divide by zero. Let's graph it a peak what we're looking at here. Five x minus seven. So we see that the function is split at x equals zero. Let's see where that's occurring. Anyway, graph that for us in the green line there. You see where that where that's occurring. You see that occurring. Now, where is it increasing? Well, it's increasing from negative infinity to x equals zero. That's where it's increasing. It's also increasing from zero to infinity. So that's kind of strange as well. It's going up, 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 and then it actually goes to infinity. Then it comes down from negative infinity, kind of trails off, but that's where it's increasing. So it's always increasing. Here too. Let's go back to the problem. So where is it increasing from negative infinity to zero? Zero to infinity, not including either, because you can never reach infinity, but that's the idea. Whoops, didn't mean to go that far. Uh, there is no relative extrema. I took the derivative, set it equal to zero, found that it was undefined, so that was the case. Where is the vertical asymptote? We saw that visually x equals zero, we can't divide by zero. So there's a vertical asymptote. There's a horizontal asymptote. Since these are of the same order, we take 5x over x, 5. Okay? So as it grows, 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 or if you think going to negative infinity, those will uh, go away. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 5. We just take the ratio. We just take the ratio when they're in the same order. So y equals five. No slant horizon, uh, no slant asymptotes. We had a horizontal, we had a vertical, but not a slant. Um, we can see where it's concave up. 
we saw from negative infinity to zero, that was up from zero to infinity, that's called game down. We could visually see that once we graphed it. Uh, there was no inflection points, we saw that. And x-intercept, that's not too bad, you just set it equal to zero, solve, Let's do that quickly. Five x minus seven, where x equals zero. Five x minus seven equals zero. X equals seven fifths. Where that occurs, I can plug it in zero. Too bad. No y intercepts. We saw that, and then just the graph. So it's just walking you through things you've already learned. Just going back to those inflection points. The only thing I think is confusing. We just have to watch out with that we don't divide by zero. Okay. Save a picture of it. Any questions about that? Is that okay? Make sense? Yeah. Let's question five. Let's see what six brings us. Yeah, I won't go through all of it, just in case this is boring, but sketch the graph the following function, which means we can just plug this in our graphing calculator, indicate whether the function is increasing or decreasing, any relative extrema, asymptotes occur, graph concave up, concave down. So there's one thing I really want to mention about this particular problem. And Now, of course, we can't divide by zero, right? We can't divide by zero. Well, where does that occur? X squared minus X minus 20 equals zero. Okay. And you're going to have different numbers, of course. But from there, you should be able to either factor it or plug it in the quadratic formula and find uh, where that, what X values that would be. So I'm going to try to factor this. Four and five look like they'd work. If I made it negative five, yeah. So you have x plus four, x minus five equals zero. So x equals four to negative five. Okay. That's interesting because. If I plug that in, we get x plus four, x plus four, x minus five. That means it can cancel. That's interesting. Well, it's interesting to me, maybe not. If I cancel that, what happens? So now x just can't be five. If I graph this, this is the thing that's of interest to me in this problem. So if I graph it and even some, let's see what Desmos says. I'm gonna show you something. Um, over squared minus x. So I found that x couldn't be negative four before. But then I reduced that away, and then I just have x can equal five. Okay, so let's go over here and see what happens. So if I go negative four, it doesn't look like there's anything at all. Like even if I zoom in, I don't see a hole or anything. But if I go over it, at that point, it's undefined. But visually, it doesn't look like it is. If I go over it, if I really make decimals think about it, it says that's undefined. So there is a hole in the graph there. There is a hole at x equals negative 4. 
even though when I graph it, it doesn't look like there is. There is. There's an infinitely small hole, and x equals negative four, or whatever your numbers are. So watch out for that. So when we have to talk about what, what this function is doing, we need to avoid that point. All right. One of the first questions it asks is, where is this decreasing? So from negative infinity, it's going down, right? But we need to skip over x equals negative four because there's a hole there. And if you don't, you'll get it wrong because technically you are wrong. You can't include that point. And it's tricky because it doesn't look like it's there, but it is there. That was really something that I wanted to mention and really kind of point to you. So notice, where is the function decreasing from negative infinity to negative 4? Because I have to skip over that negative 4, then negative 4 to 5, and then 5 to infinity. That's where it's decreasing. So I had to skip over x equals negative 4, even though it appears it reduces out, and that's why. Any questions on that point? Um, okay. No relative extreme, huh? Vertical asymptote, that's not too bad. Horizontal asymptote, y equals 0, because the order of the denominator is larger than the numerator. There's no slant asymptotes, so that's no problem. The function is concave up from five to infinity, and it's concave down from negative infinity to negative four, negative four. So we can see that visually just by graphing it. Okay. This is all chapter three stuff. A lot of it's you know the visual graph. It's too bad. As long as you have a graph calculator, it's easy. You can use your key out of 83, you know, um, but for the homework, I would think you might as well use Desmos or something. But for the test, you can use TI83. Okay. Questions on that one? All right, we're almost about five ill, and we're on question six. So let's see what we go over seven. I think the questions get more and more interesting as we go along. Let's see if you agree. So we want to find the absolute maximum minimum of this function, and look here at we have a closed interval from negative one to zero. There's a theorem that says that the absolute maximum and minimum could lie on those two points when x equals the boundaries, or it's when the first derivative equals zero. So you have to check, okay? You have to check all of those for the maximum or minimum, absolutes. If it's on a closed interval, you need to check on the interval Okay. If it's open ended, there's no guarantee that there is one. There might not be an absolute. Right? So you got to watch out for that. All right. Well, you guessed it. We have to take the derivatives. Okay. Let's set it equal to zero. Um, so again, you can just use the quadratic formula. Um, I thought that was my formula. Mm -hmm. Since all formulas are at the same time. Anyway, uh, we could set it equal to zero. Um, we did. Then we could use the quadratic formula to find there, find our points. I'll just say what they are. So we probably have different numbers anyway. I found that x equals negative three and x equals one. Now, what I really want to explain Test all points. Okay. What do I mean? Because this is a closed interval, you absolutely have to test the boundaries. If it's open ended, like the previous questions, you don't. For this, you have to, because the maximum or minimum could lie on those boundaries. 
That's the idea. So what I did was I just plugged in my calculator, F of one third, and I got negative one third cubed minus one third squared minus one third plus nine. Plugged in my calculator, and I found 248 over 27 to be the max. But I didn't know that when I plugged it in. So that was just plugging in where my first derivative equals zero, it happened to be the max, it didn't have to be. Now I've plugged in F of one. And that turned out not to be my maximum. What turned out to be my maximum was the boundary point F of negative one, which comes from this interval over here. So you do check the boundaries. There's a theorem in the book. There's a famous theorem. I can't remember. Honestly, I can't remember what the theorem is called. I don't know if it has some name attached to it, but there's a theorem that says that if we're on a closed interval, that the absolute maximum minimum could lie on the boundaries, not just the overall first derivative equaling zero. All right, any questions about that? I think that's the only thing that's different is the closed interval. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff. Remember, can I go on to eight? Did you have any questions? No. Okay. So for a dosage of X cubic centimeters cc's of a certain drug, the resulting blood pressure B is approximated by the function below. Find the maximum blood pressure and the dosage at which it occurs. So we want to find the maximum. It's on an interval. If it's on an interval, that means you have to test the boundaries of that interval. Okay. How else do you test it? You take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, and find where that occurs. Then you have to test, here you'd have to test potentially four points to see which one is the maximum. So be sure that if you're finding, or if you're given a closed interval, that you are doing just that. Let's find B prime of X. So that's two, three, eighty. So that would be seven, sixteen X. And then three times 2,280. Okay, we want to set this equal to zero. Why? Because we want to see where the first derivative is changing. That should tell us at least where this is occurring. Once we do that, I found that x equal zero and one ninth. Okay. You can plug that into the original function and find what you have. I found that my maximum actually did come from the first derivative, but really I had to test all of them. Two forty three and five six. Now the one ninth going right there, where it had me round, and that's the maximum blood pressure. Okay, I have no idea about the science. I couldn't tell you whether or not it's true or not. To me, it's just a calculus problem. I couldn't tell you blood pressure drugs. I don't know. As far as this goes. I can say, well, if that's cubic function, I can take the derivative, set it equal to zero, find uh, at least some critical points. And then from there, I can also test the boundaries. So you should test all four points. I'm just giving you what I found. Any questions about that? Okay. 
maximize b equals x times y squared, where x and y are positive numbers, such that x plus y squared equals 4. So we have two functions that we're trying to do. We want to maximize b. How do you maximize b? It's a this is a single variable calculus course and we have two variables. So how do we do that? I think one way to do it would be to solve y in terms of x. And then we'd have b in terms of x and we can maximize b in terms of x. Then we can just figure out what y is. So to do that, I'd have y squared equals four minus x. I'm not gonna solve for just y because my function is b equals y squared. So that's more helpful than if I solve for just y. That means b equals x times four minus x. So that's four x minus x squared. That's b. Now I want to maximize b. So to maximize a function, what do you do? Take the derivative, set it to equal to zero, find where that occurs, and then plug it those points into the original, see what's going on. So let's do it. B prime must be four minus two X. Set it equal to zero. So B prime equals zero. B prime is four minus two X equals zero. That implies that we have four equals two X x equals 2. So it seems to occur when x equals 2. Right? So then if that's true, then y squared equals 4 minus 2. y squared equals 2. And so y equals the square root of 2, sure, but I'm more interested in what y squared equals because of the way they set it up. So I think B is maximized when X times Y squared. It's two times two, which is four. With my numbers, but it might randomize it. Questions, comments, or concerns about that? Okay. No, we had, we had this as a homework problem once upon a time. I think it was after, it must have been after the midterm, but let's, let's do it again. So the, a lifeguard needs a rope for a rectangular swimming area in front of Long Lake Beach using 500 yards of rope and floats. What dimensions of the rectangle will maximize the area? What is the maximum area? Note that the shoreline is one side of the rectangle. That's a terrible drawing, but it'll work well enough for me. Okay. So we have the shoreline, and then we want to find what are the dimensions of this rectangle. Here, we know what the perimeter is. Okay. We know the perimeter is 500, right? And since we're using the shoreline as a boundary, we don't have to use a piece of rope for that. So if I call that X, on this x and I call that y, then that means for the perimeter, I have 500 equals 2x plus y. Now, why am I setting a perimeter when I'm trying to find the maximum area? Because they gave me the perimeter, I can rearrange this to only have one variable. That can really uh, help me, especially if I only know single variable calculus. So now I think y equals 500 minus 2x. Now we know the area of a rectangle is just length times width. In this case, the area is just x times y. But I have y in terms of x, so I can break area in terms of just x.
And we go, that's the answer to the first part is putting area in terms of X. There we have it. Now, you want to maximize this thing. So, of course, what are you going to do? Take the derivative, set it equal to zero, find where that occurs, and then find for bulk variables, just like we did for the last one. So, I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to rewrite this before I take the derivative. So, DA. Dx equals 500 minus 4x. Right? Set that equal to zero. So x equals 500 divided by 4. That's 250 divided by 2, 125. x equals 125. If x equals 125, then plug that going in here. So then y equals 500 minus 2 times 125, and you get 250. So y equals 250, x equals 125. You can multiply them together to find the maximum area. Thirty-one thousand two hundred fifty. You want to multiply these two numbers together. Okay. That is the first chunk of material. That's basically that's the first chunk. Any questions about that so far? There's no questions. I'm going to take my first break. I'll take 10 minutes, come back, and we will continue. Okay. Back in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm.
All right, we are back. We're going to go over to problems. Um, and yeah, um, again, if you have any, if you get stuck on any of these problems, any of those with peers here, let me share my screen. That would help. Um, you can always just hit ask my instructor. That's the best way for me uh, to help. Okay. Even over screenshots, please just hit ask my instructor in this so I don't get this time. Because that tells me the version of the problem. It gives me a link. I can just quickly look at it and I don't have to do any digging. So if you need help, please do that. All right. I'm going to start at question 12 and hopefully cut through some more problems. All right, this not, isn't too bad as long as you remember uh, your formulas. And the first thing we're asked for is delta y. So we have to recall what delta y was. Um, so delta y is f of x plus delta x minus f of x, which of course you can see where this is coming from. So we recall the definition of a derivative. Here we are. Okay, so the, it'll randomize what it gives you, uh, but the idea is the same. So I'm gonna plug in f of x plus delta x. Now my x is three and my delta x is three. So that's why I'm plugging in three plus three is six. Then I'm gonna subtract f of three because those are my numbers, whatever your numbers, uh, or whatever your numbers. So you have to keep an eye on that. All right, so I'm going to do that. Seven times six minus nine minus seven times three minus nine. So this should give me some change in the vertical. Okay, that's what it's going to give me. And I found that that is 21. So it's not hard to evaluate that for sure. It's just we're calling which formula. So you might want to make a note of that on your uh, formula sheet that that's, that's what we're looking for. Now the next one, it gives you the formula and that helps a lot. So we don't have to just remember. It says dy equals f prime of x dx. And of course, we've been using that all along. dy dx is the same thing as f prime of x. We're just solving for dy. So we've been using that all along. Now, what is my f prime of x? It's going to be different for all of us because it randomizes it. But for me, my f of x, I'm sorry, f prime of x would just be the number seven. It's the slope of that line. And then I want to multiply by my uh, dx. So we have seven dx. dy equals seven times three. So not too bad. You just have to recall those ones. So watch out for that. Okay. Sure. Any questions about that? Of course, it's going to vary the numbers. That kind of thing, but I think the idea would be the same. Right, that was 12. Should at least talk about 13. The thing with 13 is it is having you do things in an incremental way. And that can be uh, a little strange. So I'm given a function, I'm given the revenue or whatever this is. I guess it's lawn chairs. Okay. And it says, what is the current revenue, All right? So I'm selling at 80 lawn chairs that give me the revenue. So I can just find R of 80, okay? Just plugging it in. Okay. 
when I did that, I found 2,912. All right, part B, how much increase if 85 lawn chairs were sold daily? So now we're doing 85, so I find R of 85. Okay, when I put those numbers in, I found 3,465. Okay. That's when we sell 85. They want to know how much increase would be. So the increase, this is like using just a calculate, or I'm sorry, it's like thinking about calculus in an algebraic way. So I'm doing R of 85 minus R of 80, which would tell me the increase, the delta Y. I think that's the delta Y. So for my numbers, I just subtract them. And I found $553.88. Part C, what is the marginal revenue? So R prime. Prime of X is the first derivative. So three times five is 15, so it's 0 0.015. X squared, two times five is 10, so that's 0 0.1 X. And then the X goes away, so I'm just 0.4 X, all right. And they want it at 80, so they are prime. Of 80, they're going to work us, they're working us up to the point where we can just do the calculus using an algebraic idea. So R prime of 80, just plug that in. No. Now. What it wants us to do is to take this R prime, the first derivative at the original price, and then we're going to add it to the revenue of the original price, and that would be the new price, approximately, approximately. That is the idea. Let me switch colors. So the idea is that you can take R of X plus R prime, I really should say of A or something. In my case, it's 80, so of some number. That's the one more, selling one more, right? Because you have the slope and you're just adding it just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Okay. In my case, that's R of 80 plus R prime 80. So I'm just adding this to this. And that should be approximately the new revenue. Okay. We're just increasing it by a little bit, just using the uh, algebra techniques. And I think maybe there's more pieces, but really you're just adding it again and again. Yeah, so for me, it's 82. So I just add that again. And then 83, I just add it again. Okay. So I'm just adding it again. That's just kind of thinking about calculus in an algebraic way. Any questions about that? Okay, uh, elasticity. 
So elasticity of a function is, for us, it's an equation. If you study business or something, you might want to go a little deeper. It's negative P. This could be X. If the variable is X, we use X. So it's negative P times the first derivative over the original function tells us the elasticity. Okay. So I need to find what is the first derivative. So d prime of p equals negative one. So I can plug that in to this. I get negative p, which is the variable, times negative one over 238 minus p. So that is p over 238 minus p. That's the elasticity. Find the elasticity of the given price. So you can plug that in. Fairly easy to do. 102 was my given. I found it was three quarters. Now, you might also have this written down. If the elasticity is greater than one, equals one, less than one. Okay. This is gonna tell you if it's inelastic, elastic, or a unit part. If it equals one, that's the unit. If it's greater than one, it's elastic. And elastic. All right, mine was three fourths. That's less than one. It's positive, but it's less than one. So this is inelastic. But I would I would have this formula on my cheat sheet, my formula sheet, and I might even have this just as a reference. Okay. Elastic unit if it equals one at that point. Sometimes we want to know what that is, so we set it equal to one and solve. I think that's was that the last part where we do that? Yeah, and so it says find the values of which is total maximum. So what can you do? You can just simply set it equal to one and find that for yourself. Here we have P. P. 238 minus P equals one, solve for P. Okay, so P equals 238 minus P, 2P equals 238, P equals 119. Just saying, P and P one. All right, there is quite a bit of um, finding the implicit differentiation or implicit derivative on the final exam. So we need to practice that. Luckily, it's on the homework quite a bit. So remember that when you find the derivative implicitly, that is y is a function of x. So think y equals f of x. Okay, so let's take the derivative with y being a function of x. So if I do that, I get, well, here I'm gonna have to use product rule. So I get nine y plus nine x dy dx. And then the derivative of one would just be zero equals zero. So from here I can solve for dy dx. So nine x y dx equals negative nine y 
dy dx was negative 9y over 9x. Now I can simplify. Yeah. Next one. Find the implicit differentiation. All right, so we just got to remember y is a function of s. So we would have 2y dy dx minus 3x squared equals zero. Now this means you derivative of a constant to equal zero. And they want at this particular point, okay, so I think I'm gonna solve for dy dx before I before I plug in my values. Okay. This would become two y dy dx equals 3x squared dy dx equals 3x squared over 2y. Now I'm going to plug in the values they gave me, which was 2, negative 4, dy dx equals 3 times 2 squared over 2 times negative 4. From there, I found negative 3. Okay, so that was 16. I think 17 is kind of hard, but we should do it. This was similar to one that was on the homework. Okay, uh, so let's do it. And the reason why it's hard is because you have to find the second derivative implicitly. Remember that y is f of x. Okay. So let's do that. So if we take the derivative, we get 3x squared minus 9y squared dy dx by chain rule equals zero. Solve for dy dx, okay? So if I move things around, I get negative y squared dy dx equals negative three x squared. Divide both sides by negative nine y dx equals negative three x squared over negative nine y squared. And I can simplify a little bit here, make that a positive, and then this would become one, that would become a three. So I think I get dy dx, it's x squared over 3y squared. Let me see if I agree with myself at first. Yes, I do. Okay. So that's the first derivative, but it wants the second derivative, not the first derivative. <clears throat> but we have to find the first derivative, find the second one, right? So that being said, let's recall that we found dy dx equals x squared over three y squared. Okay, now we have to take the derivative of this function, and that's gonna mean that we have to use quotient rule. Okay, so d squared y over dx squared would equal two x times three y squared minus x squared times six y dy dx, 3y squared squared. Okay, uh, let's clean that up a little bit. We get 6xy squared minus 6x squared y dy dx 
over 3 y squared to the square. Okay, now I have dy d squared in the second derivative. And I know what the first derivative is, so I need to plug that in here. Okay, and that's what makes this problem quite a bit more challenging than the others. So 6xy squared minus 6x squared y. X squared. 3y squared. Y squared. 3y squared. There we go. Okay, now we've plugged it in. Now we need to think about what we can do here. I have. 3y squared there and 3y squared here. That means if I multiplied that over here, or if I took that and divided by it, it would be all over the same denominator. That being said, we could just increase that by one, and then we would be good to go. So that's what I'm gonna do. That's the last step, just to simplify. 6xy squared minus 6x squared y x squared all over 3y squared cubed. Now, you just need to simplify. That's the big deal. It's the remaining part. So the trick with finding the second derivative is that you have to plug the first derivative in and then simplify. That makes it quite a bit more challenging than our average homework question. We've we've seen that before. It's question 17. Um, 18. We are now dealing with now dealing with x of t, y of t, let y equals x squared plus six and dx dt equal five when x equals one, find dy dt. Okay, so this is chain rule, dy dt equals dy dx dx dt by chain rule. Okay, so let us do that. So I'm given y equals x squared plus two, so y prime will equal 2x. And there we go. So then we have 2x times dx dt. And they told me dx dt equals 5. And x equals 1. Easy stuff. So just got to know what you're dealing with. Okay, a circle is growing. Its radius increases by four millimeters per second. So that's telling us a rate of change. Find the rate at which the area is changing at the moment when the radius equals 17. Radius is changing. Our radius prime of t equals four millimeters. Okay. Find the rate at which the area changes. So dA dt equals what? How does the radius change? Well, what is the area of a circle pi r squared? So we need to find dA dt. Well, that's dA dt equals dA dr dr dt. So what's dA dr? 2 pi r. So that's how the area changes in terms of the radius, and we know how the radius term changes in terms of time. So we have 2 pi r times dr dt, 
We are told that's four. So that's two pi times, for my numbers, 17 times four. And I did use the pi button in my calculator to find rounded correctly. It seemed like, uh, if I remember correctly, when I just used 3.14, it wasn't accurate uh, as far as the homework goes. So watch out for that. All right, and then I believe the rest is integrals. So that's some of the newer stuff. Hopefully that's going okay. So find the integral. Okay, so I have x to the negative 8 dx. So recall this is going the opposite way is the derivative. So we're going to increase this by 1. So that would be x to the negative 7. And then when I take the derivative, I need that to go away. So when we take the derivative of this, it'll go to negative 8, but we need that to go away. So what's going to happen? Negative seven there, that would, that would make it go away. Uh, but we can clean it up, negative one over seven x seven. And then we have a constant of integration because we don't know where this began, okay? That, that's, that's pretty new stuff, so hopefully that's okay. All right, here we see we have the natural exponent. Um, if we want, we could pull out the eight. So we have eight e to the three x dx. If we choose, we can pull out eight. It's just a constant, it won't change what's going on. And recall that e to the ax taking the derivative is just going to give you a e to the ax by chain rule. Here we want to to undo each other, right? So when we take the derivative, we get a three, but we don't have that three already. So we need to multiply it by one third to undo that. We have the integration constant. So that's, that's fairly easy stuff. 22, here we have a definite integral which means we're going to evaluate it. All right, so let's think about two plus two x dx. All right, the first two doesn't have variables, so it's of order zero, now it becomes of order one. All right, then we have two there. There's already a one here, so that's gonna become two. But we need that to go away, so that's one half. Cancel. I'm going to evaluate this at 2 to 4 because that's what they asked me to do. This will give us the area under that curve. So 2x plus x squared evaluated at 2 to 4. And we're going to plug in 4 and subtract and plug in 2. Get 2. Oops. Uh, find the area between the curve and the x-axis while well, the x-axis is just when y equals zero. So that's fine. One to 10, two over x, dx. So if I want, I can pull that two out. It's not doing much for me. Now I want to find the integral of one over x. So that's x to the negative first. Now, if we took the derivative of that, we would subtract one, we would get negative two. 
But here we're adding to the exponent, so it's zero. So what on earth do you do there? Well, recall the derivative the natural logarithm is one over x, and that's exactly what we have here. So this is going to be two times the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x evaluated from one to 10. Okay. That's two natural logarithm of 10. That kind of weird. Minus two natural logarithm of whoops. And that goes to zero because natural logarithm one is just zero. Natural logarithm absolute value of 10. Okay. Have a value formula. So if you want to find the average value. You go one over b minus a, a to b. So here they want the average value, so we easily find that 22 minus 0, 0 to 22, x squared plus x means 11, dx. That is one over 22, one third x cubed plus one half squared minus 11 x, zero, 22. All right, so when you plug in zero, it just goes to zero. So it's just putting our endpoint there. I did that in my calculator, about 484 over 3. Okay. But you want that average value of 1. It's over 27. Here. So for 27, um, I might say it could be helpful to graph these two derivatives to see which one is more. I think we saw this in the homework before, but um, as far as that goes, I think that might be helpful just determining which one is higher. They, here we have Alice as the first derivative of, of some function, and then Ben is another derivative of another function. How many more words does that person? So once you figure out the winner, then you can just integrate. Um, so I found that Alice was the winner from zero to 10. We can find where that occurs. Alice was the first one. And how many more? So I just subtracted from what Ben did. I think I asked for the average. Here, my average was one tenth. So when I found that, I just divided by ten. It wasn't too bad. Let's go over this one. Let's 
So here, we don't know how to do something like that. Of course, if we're taking the derivative, we'd use the chain rule. But here we don't have, or I'm sorry, I said chain rule, I meant the uh, quotient rule, but we don't have a quotient rule for integrals. So what do we have to do? Well, let's try u substitution and see what happens. So u equals a plus e to the degree of t, du dt equals 3e to the 3t. And just by coincidence, I happen to have one there. So that means that du equals 3e to the 3t dt. Okay, so let's do that. That we have du over u, and that's again, remember that d over dx of the natural logarithm of x, 1 over x. So that means that we have ln absolute value of u plus c natural log of 3e to the 3t plus c. Oops, A, A plus, let's rewrite that. Put in the wrong U, A plus E to the three to the, there you go. We do about this one again. We don't have a quotient rule for integrals, so let's use u substitution and just see what happens. If it works, it works. Du dx equals 2x. Okay, so I don't have a 2x there, but I do have an x. So du equals 2x dx. I don't have that, but I have is I have x dx. So what I can do is I can just divide both sides by two. That ought to do it. So that means that du over two equals x dx, which I have, I have x dx. So this becomes du two u to the fifth. I can pull the one half out, that's no trouble. Du, u to the fifth, that's like u to the negative five. So I need to add one, that'd be negative four. Then undo what happens when the derivative, so it'd be one fourth. So we get one eighth u to the negative fourth plus c. And I can clean that up. So one eighth, one over u, my u was one minus x squared to the fourth plus c. There we go. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. I, I hope, I hope, I hope. Uh, I really suggest going through the homework and uh, getting 100% on it before you take the exam. Uh, don't forget you have a quiz and an advice quiz uh, to do for extra credit. I think overall it should go well, especially if you've been doing well in the class so far. I'll stick around for questions and then please just email me if you have any further questions, okay? All right, have a good rest of your summer.